Good morning. I expect that everybody watching us online was shouting good morning back to the screen, right? If you weren't and you missed it, let's do that again. Good morning. It is a blessing to see each and every one of you and to spend these holy and sacred moments in worship. We also understand that this is the beginning of spring break. We know that many people are going to be connecting with us throughout the week as their schedule permits. So whenever you're connecting with us, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. It is a blessing to see you. We do have some events coming up in the life of the church. Our youth will be having one of their first in-person meetings of this year this afternoon at 530 in the youth area. Remember to bring your mask, remember social distancing, but we're excited to be doing that together. So my friends, for all of us who are gathered here in person, for all of us worshiping online, let us lift our voices in praise of God as we share our opening hymn. Now thank we all our God, all three verses. The words we speak all too often do not show you in our lives, God of our pilgrimage. We spend so much time boasting to others, they imagine we have no need for you. We grumble impatiently when you don't respond immediately to our requests, but are slow to sing your praises. We mutter under our breath about the behavior of those around us when we could be asking them if there is some way we could serve them. It is in our journey to the cross and to the tomb that you fill us with the riches of your mercy. Steadfast love, you do so not because of anything we have done, but because of the compassion which flows from your heart wounded by our failings. As we open our lives to receive your forgiveness, may we turn to the light which brings us life following Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, 
every step of the way. Please be seated. I now invite you to join me in your bulletin and for those of you at home with our affirmation of faith this morning. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And I invite you to bow your head and join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Creator, we gather here in worship and in awe of you this morning as your children who understand that we need your help. When we have been cruel, we have needed your help to learn how to be kind. When we have fallen on the path, we have needed your help to stand once more. We ask that you continue to give us your blessing so that we might truly understand what it means to be disciples, to be children, and to be followers of your way of life. We ask and beseech you to guide us as we go along in this world, trying our best to do your will. We pray this in your name. Amen. I now invite you in that prayer that we were taught so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
My friends, it is a blessing to be on this journey with you this morning. We continue on this Sunday of Lent. And during this season of Lent, we are challenging ourselves to follow along with our wonderful colleague, sister in faith, Reverend Susan Robb of Highland Park United Methodist Church, who wrote a book called Seven Words, Listening to Jesus from the Cross. And we were going through each of those statements that Jesus made from the cross and finding hope and comfort in those seven statements. You know, if you had a loved one, a friend, a family member who was in their last moments of life, the words that they would share would be words that encapsulates their life, what they stand for, things that they would want to pass on to you, things that mean the most to them. And we find that Jesus did this same thing from the cross, speaking these final words to us, that encapsulates his mission and ministry. In our Ash Wednesday together, we talked about forgiveness. And our journey through Lent together has led us through hope, faith, service to others. And now we bring ourselves to this place where we listen yet again as Jesus teaches us about spiritual food. What feeds our souls? Let me ask you, what feeds your soul? What feeds your hungry, ravenous spirit? You know, as I say that this morning, my stomach is already growling. I don't know if you've actually heard that through my microphone. You know, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm physically hungry right now. And what I'm thinking of in this very moment is cheeseburgers, bacon, tacos, tacos, tacos. And, and I even find some agreement with my little friends sitting right here near the front. Jacob, Jonah, and Chloe like tacos, bacon, cheeseburgers, yes. We also know that there are good things to eat, like broccoli, salads. And we know that there's also things that harm us if we eat too much of, right? In the same way it is with our spirits. There are things that nourish our spirits, and there are things that harm us and pollute our spirits. Can you remember one of those times when you were so hungry that you were angry? We have a word for that, don't we? We call it being hangry. I know what that's like. Have you ever been in one of those times where you were so hungry, you've lost all focus? where you have lost all sense of yourself, maybe one of those times where you felt like giving up because you were so hungry. Years ago, I was with a scout troop, and we were in Arkansas, and it was in the middle of August. It was hot. It was beyond hot. And we were climbing up this, they called it a mountain. Okay, we'll give them that a little bit. We were climbing up this vertical uh, rock face, it had steps, we were trying to get to the top, and I am an insulin-dependent diabetic, okay? I, I, I ate that morning, I ate a good, good meal, but I realized as I got halfway up that mountainside, 
my energy was gone. My energy was gone. I had stopped sweating. I knew I was in trouble. I had no more snack bars in my backpack. My blood sugar, I could tell, was going real low. And I thought to myself, I'm in trouble. I make it to near the top, and I sit down. And as these teenagers were running marathons, climbing this hill that they called a mountain that seemed to me to be a Mount Everest in front of me, they were just sprinting back and forth. And here it was, I am literally laying down on the ground. And I told one of our leaders, I'm having a medical issue. I think I can make it to the car. Just give me a moment to catch my breath. Turned out several of the other adults said, we need a break too. And we rested there for a minute. And we got up and we made the trek to the car. And they knew that we had to stop. We stopped at a convenience store along the way because I was so hungry. My blood sugar was going so low. And we stopped at this convenience store, and I remember getting some snacks, and we told the boys, this is a wonderful opportunity. We're going to treat you to snacks and ice cream. They were stopping for me. And we stopped, and I remember getting some snacks. But what caught my attention that I hadn't had since I was a child was an orange knee-high soda in the bottle. And it was sitting in a box with ice. And there was ice droplets running down the side of it. Now we're talking full knee-high soda here. Lots of sugar packed into the soda. And I remember taking that soda and opening it. My friends, that was the most amazing orange knee-high soda that has ever been made in the history of the universe. Have you ever been in that place where you've been so hungry, so thirsty, that when you do finally find something that fills that void, that quenches that thirst, it is the best thing that you have ever tasted. It is the best thing that has ever crossed your parched lips. And you could have it again two years from now, and it will never be the same. Because what you were experiencing enhanced what you received. How many times in our spiritual journey do we find moments like that in worship, in service with another, talking with someone, that that moment means the world to us. It provides that nourishment for our thirsty spirits. But my friends, when we look out into the world around us, we find that people are crying out, I'm thirsty. Now, that, that's kind of developed a negative connotation with some of our youth growing up today. Let's reclaim that statement back. The statement from the cross, I'm thirsty. Do you hear that from the world around us? People who have this void within their lives. People who feel like they are struggling in a desert. You know that desert area where the ground is cracked and parched? where you're crawling toward what you think is an oasis. You think that there's the water there, and you go and you begin to drink of it, but only find hot, arid sand. So many people today are starved. Their spirits are starved. Their spirits are thirsty. There is this hole within them that they can't seem to fill with everything else in the world. And they're crying out, crying out to be fed, crying out to have their thirst quenched as they are struggling, losing energy, losing focus, losing themselves. As we journey to the cross, let's listen to Jesus for just a few moments. As Jesus takes us into one of these deep and dark moments, from John chapter 19, beginning in verse 28, after this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. 
A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So often in our journey of faith, when we talk about Jesus, we talk about Jesus in a divine way, right? God in flesh, God wrapped in human flesh, Jesus, the Son of God. But this scripture today reminds us of the humanity of Jesus. You know, we believe in the Christian faith that Jesus is fully God, fully divine, but yet also fully human. That means that Jesus experiences what you and I experience. Jesus experienced hurt and pain and torture and betrayal, even death. Jesus experienced moments in which he wept, moments in which he cried. Jesus experienced the very gamut of emotions that we experience in our lives. And here in this moment, Jesus called out, I am thirsty. Let me ask you, what kept Jesus on that cross? I mean, on the one hand, if we believe in the divinity of Jesus, then we know that Jesus had the power in that moment to call down the angels from heaven and to release the nails that bound him to the cross and to free him from that pain. But here, we struggle with listening to the human side of Jesus, the Jesus that cries out, the Jesus that says, I'm thirsty. What kept Jesus on that cross was love. Love for you. Love for me. A God's love for God's chosen people. For all of humanity. Chosen by God. Loved by God. Redeemed by God. Love kept Jesus on that cross. But when we look around in the world around us right now, we see such a shortage of love. Even some of the love that we do see has strings attached to it, conditions that are placed on it. Well, I'll love you until you do this. Or I'll love you until you make me angry. Or I'll love you until you vote for this person in the next runoff. Or I'll love you until... You believe this way. But God loves us right where we are. In the midst of our deserts that we crawl through. In the midst of our struggle and our isolation. And in the midst of being completely hungry and thirsty for what fills that void in our spirits. God's love comes to us. God meets us where we are. And God loves us. When we look at the world around us, the world needs that kind of love. Amen? The world needs that kind of vaccine for the real plague that is destroying us. A plague of hatred. A plague of prejudice. A plague of fear. It is God's love that provides that healing salve to the open wounds of our world. So I want to challenge us all as we go through this week ahead of, of, ahead of us. Look for opportunities that you can share that unending, unimaginable, amazing love of God with other people. Look for those opportunities. Don't just say, well, I'm going to love today if it comes my way. Look for opportunities to share that love. Look and be intentional about sharing that love of God because you never know where a person may be in the deserts around them that needs that thirst-quenching love of God. You know, when Jesus says, I, I thirst from the cross, it reminds me of 
this story earlier in his ministry where Jesus was in the land of, of, of Samaria. And he comes to this well. And this Samaritan woman meets him about the middle of the day. And it was hot. And Jesus told her, he said, I, I'm thirsty. And he strikes up a conversation with her. And she was taken back by this because here it is, this Jewish man defied the culture of their times, what was expected of Jewish men, and he spoke to her. I mean, others may look down upon him for doing that. Others may even try to discredit him for doing that. But Jesus met her where she was in the desert of her life. He met her. And he said, I'm thirsty. And she makes a statement that she's there at the well. Does Jesus not know who he is speaking to her? And he said, if you knew who I was, if you really knew who I was, I can give you living water to drink. And she said, you don't even have a bucket. You don't even have a bucket to send down into the well. You don't even have a bucket. How is it that you can give me this living water? And in John chapter 4, verse 14, Jesus says this to her. Those who drink the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give them will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. Now, doesn't that sound like wonderful water to you? Water in which... One taste and we'll never thirst again. A water that stirs up the spring within us and flows out into the world. Our world needs this right now. Our world needs this living water. Our world is crying out in the midst of darkness and a pandemic and social and political division that we perhaps have never seen in our lifetimes. The world is crying out, saying, I'm thirsty. And they look to us as people, beloved children of God, God who claim the name Christian to be the means by which God uses to quench their thirst. My friends, we are the buckets that dips into the wells of God's eternal love. And we pour that love out to a thirsty world. May the waters of God's love spring forth and gush out into the world in and through God's faithful, beloved children. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. I invite you this morning to join us in our hymn of response. O oh God, our help in ages past. And we will be singing together verses 1, 2, 5, and 6. And for those of you worshiping online with us, we want to hear those voices. The words will be on the screen, and we want to hear you. So let us join together and lift our voices to the God who knows us, loves us, redeems us, and sends us into the world.
Please be seated. My friends, as we come to this time expressing our generosity, let me say thank you. Thank you to the way all of you have risen up in the face of disaster here at Ridgewood Park Church where two water pipes that froze during this last winter storm burst and caused flooding in our gym and in our ministry center, both of which now are currently shut down, undergoing renovation. We set our goal in a capital campaign to raise $10,000. That is our deductible. To date, we have raised over $22,000. What a blessing. What a blessing, my friends. Thank you so much for seeing that need and even doubling that need. Thank you. You are a wonderful blessing. But I call your attention to our general fund. Because as we give to this reconstruction effort, the salaries that we pay, the bills that we incur for our lights, our internet, our ability to stream, we need your help in our general fund. And we've taken some hits over January and February. But March can be an amazing, amazing month. Because my friends, together we rise to that challenge. And we meet it head on. Because we are a family. So for those of you in person, I invite you to give. You may give at the baskets located in the back of the sanctuary. For those who are worshiping with with us online, You can give online at ridgewoodparkchurch.org. You may also text to give. You may also mail your gift to the church. We are checking those daily, and each and every amount given is needed. Thank you. So let us join together as we ask God's blessing over this offering. God of light and love, As Jesus shined your light into our troubled world, may our offering bring rays of your holy light into the dark corners of our world. May these gifts reach the places where the fear of death holds sway, that others may find Christ's life in the midst of their pain, in the midst of their deserts, in the midst of their struggles. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
would join me now in singing our closing hymn, Immortal God, Only um, Immortal Invisible God, Only Wise, verses one, two, and four. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name. My friends, it has been a blessing worshiping with you this day. I hope you have been blessed by our time together. A special thank you to Brittany for filling in at the last moment. Thank you for blessing us today, Brittany. And thank you to Roz for filling in at the last moment as well with the Gloria Pottery. Thank you, Roz. My friends, you may have a question in your mind. Something that we have said here today, maybe something that we have sung here, has sparked a question in your mind. I invite you to reach out. Uh, let's explore those questions of faith together. Also, you may be wondering, how do I join this church in the United Methodist Church? I invite you to that conversation, and let's explore that together. We are always here for you. So my friends, as we go out into the world, we're going out into a world where people's spirits are parched. They are dry. People are struggling in these difficult times, and they feel Many feel that they don't matter, that they don't belong, that they aren't included. My friends, be living reflections of the love and grace of God so that those to whom love is a stranger finds in each of you a warm and generous friend. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen.